put this. There, there. What did I do with my notes? Um, okay, I'm going to call the meeting of the pension board to order and seek approval of the minutes. I will motion motion to approve the minutes we'll of be. the November meeting. One little, one little change, not not no big. My last name is spelled wrong on the, adjourn, on the adjournment. Should be Mr. Pramer seconded. Not a big deal. I'll second the motion with that yep. change. Okay. Perfect. All in favor? Aye. With the adjustment, opposed? No, passes unanimous. Is there any public comment? <clears throat> There's no public comment. We'll move on. Um, pension applications. Jerry, are you up there? I am. Can everyone hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. And I want to apologize. I was actually on the meeting last month, but I was having uh, audio problems and I thought I had unmuted and I believe I did, but for some reason you could, you could not hear me. I could hear you. So my apologies for what appeared to be my absence, uh, which was not the case. Um, that, so in, I, in that I case, understood. In that case, we won't fire you then. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. If you do. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, we have two applications to submit um, for this evening's meeting. And, and uh, Frank, just for the, the benefit of everybody on the panel, um, you and I exchanged an email earlier today or yesterday um, regarding last month's, and that was for Mr. Flores. He has not yet returned corrected paperwork to me with a revised beneficiary <clears throat> designation. So um, we are not resubmitting his application at tonight's meeting. Thank you for that, Jerry. Of course. Okay, let's get to the two that we do have. Um, the first one is Thomas Hamilton, Chief Financial Officer at the Board of Education. Um, his is a regular pension. He elected the standard option and his monthly benefit will be 8,569.08 annualized to 102,828.96. The second uh, application is on behalf of Stacy Densmore, a clerk typist with the police department. Hers is also a regular pension. She also elected the standard option and her monthly benefit will be 797, annualized to 9,564. My a minor thing uh, on the form chair, the percentage the percentages for uh, Tom's uh, beneficiaries. Can you bring it to that decimal point, thirty three point three three percent, or, or it's really minor? I know on my end we can't do that, but can we do that on this end? Yes, I mean we have we have done that before, okay. but yes, that can that can certainly be done. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Motion to approve. Yeah, by the way, just one thing is, um, I don't know, I know Charlie was on the board at the time, um, but Tom was on this board, this, the pension board for a number of years, and, uh, and he was really excellent. He was, he was the chief financial officer of the city at the time. So anyways, good. I just want to say good luck to Tom. And um, with that, if there's a motion to accept the minute, the uh, pensions that you just started. Is there a second to that? I'll second, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Passes unanimous. Excellent. PIMCO. Right. So Great. Frank, tonight we have Kevin Dunn and John <clears throat> Cavalieri here who presented to the board uh, a few times before. And as you all know, PIMCO is both the pension and OPEB's real assets manager <clears throat> and um, with that, I will turn it over to Kevin and, and John. Um, about 30, 35 minutes, including questions, would be great. Okay, thanks, Britt. Is there any specific topic areas you want us to kind of focus on as well? Um, I think if there's any update to the team uh, or the process, um, you can spend a few minutes on that. Otherwise, dive right into the strategy. I think everyone's interested in 
PIMCO's outlook on the inflationary environment that we're seeing and um, how the strategy is positioned to um, <clears throat> do well in that certain environment. I think that was the main focus, the inflation and the, the tips, uh, exposure, that kind of stuff. Well, that, that sounds good. Um, the strategy definitely benefits from inflation. So John will certainly get into that. And uh, um, we have tips allocations in there as well. So first and foremost, thanks for being a long-term client. I think over 16 years now in the strategy and being a partner, we, we appreciate the partnership with PIMCO. Um, as you know, I'm Kevin Dunn, your account manager with PIMCO, work out of the New York office. Um, and with me today is John Cavallari, who joined last year in June 2020. Um, and presented as well. So uh, John is our lead strategist in the asset allocation team. Um, and he also headed up our inflation team for quite a few years as well. So he's, he's quite the expert in that area. So um, John, maybe if you provide a quick overview of what the strategy is and kind of dive into performance and outlook, I'm sure they would appreciate that. You're great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleased to be here. Of course, if you have questions, I invite you to just... Uh, Interject, interrupt, wave your hands if you get your video on, and I'll do my best to uh, to address your question in, in real time. Um, and, and by the way, it, is it is it better if I share the screen or if I just call out the page numbers? What do you prefer? I'm I'm fine with page numbers. I don't know what everyone else feels, but I I've got a good view here. Yeah, doesn't make a difference to me, but I've got the pages. Yeah, I okay. believe page. Pages are fine. You don't have to go into the screen. Okay, great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce through a few just level setting or overview slides of the asset strategy. Again, so we're on the same page, and then we'll go right into performance, outlook, talk about inflation, the funds positioning with respect to um, opportunities and inflation risks specifically. Page four is a great starting point. <clears throat> so... As we talk about in the upper left, you know, most investors, institutional or individual, have built their portfolio around core allocations to mainstream stocks and bonds. Those have done wonderfully over the last decade, but today they are literally at or just off of all-time high price levels in stocks, all-time low yield levels in bonds. So there's a dramatic need for diversification of return sources in a portfolio as we go forward. Uh, number two. We also recognize that mainstream stocks and bonds from a macroeconomic perspective have a disinflationary bias. They tend to do best when inflation is low, if not mildly falling. Neither does well when inflation is on the march. And we've seen that year to date. We've seen that in other historical periods of time. So that's really the role that all assets serves to play in a portfolio. It's a, it's a diversifying complement to your mainstream stocks and bonds. We want to diversify your return sources to, to other diversifying and out of mainstream asset classes, uh, as we say in the upper upper right. Part of what provides that diversification is the macro angle, that a lot of these asset classes have a positive response to inflation. Rising inflation tends to be a tailwind. So there's an explicit inflation protection orientation to all asset as well. All in all, as we say in the very upper right, we seek a long-term return, that, that is in line with a CPI plus five, 5% 5 over inflation. Not every calendar year, markets don't offer that every year, but over a full cycle. And we wanna do it with moderate average volatility, volatility that is on average about 9%. So that's the same level of vol as a 60-40 portfolio. But as I said, compositionally, we don't look anything like a 60-40 stock bond blend. What do we look like? Well, something more like on page five. This is stylistic, but it just makes the, the point. As I said, a 60-40 portfolio tends to look like something on the left. Rooted in 60-40, a little bit of diversification on the fringe. All asset is basically the inverted version of that with a diversifying inflation sensitive assets. That's the core of our portfolio. And yeah, true to our name, we'll use a little bit of mainstream equities and core bonds around the fringes. But we're really rooted in this diversifying inflation sensitive assets. And you can see our actual allocations on page six. I won't go into all the details here, but uh, the main takeaway is that those green diversifiers, on average, that's three quarters of our portfolio. Uh, you'll also see that we're tactical over time and we'll talk about uh, where we are today. Um, for, for brevity, I'm gonna jump ahead to page eight. And page eight, 
is an interesting page in that it shows you diversification cycles. So sometimes we can be lulled into thinking that a 60-40 portfolio, here shown in red, always outperforms. It doesn't. The red bars indicate years where a 60-40 port portfolio outperforms the all-asset style of portfolio, which is shown in green. The green bars represent the opposite. They represent the calendar years where the all-asset style of portfolio outperforms 60-40. It goes back and forth to be sure. Uh, sometimes you get big equity bull markets like the late 90s there. You see those three red bars in the middle. That was the run-up to the dot-com era. Of course, that was followed by a big reversal uh, where all the diversifiers, inflation-sensitive assets outperformed for the decade of the 2000s. Then you saw the last nine years or so, really since 2013, another equity-led bull market except 2021 has started to provide an inflection point where the diversifiers are, start, are positioned to really take advantage and be the leaders for the next, call it five to 10 years, the next cycle. So this mean reverting element speaks to why you want to diversify in your portfolio, number one. It speaks to why your diversifier may have had lower returns in the recent years, which was an equity bull market period, but why on a go forward basis for the next five to 10 years, this style of portfolio is likely to be the outperformer and may even be extra important should inflation risks materialize. Okay, that's, that's the overview from a high level in terms of the rationale for an all asset portfolio. Um, any questions at the high level before we do a performance review? Hey John, on, on page eight, those returns, are those actual all asset returns or is that uh conceptual conceptual yeah so so they're not the actual fund the fund was launched in 03 we can't we can't make this kind of chart if we go back into the 70s so what we did is we created a a proxy of all asset which is disclosed there in the footnotes it's it's simply an equal weighted mix of the major diversifiers that all asset is built on so it's an equal weighted mix of tips commodities reits emerging market bonds emerging market stocks, and high yield bonds. Okay. okay. So it's an all asset proxy. Concept, okay. Yep. And the, and the base here, uh, you know, the, uh, the red lines here are US equities, correct? S&P 500, 60%, Barclays yep. Ag, 40%. Yep. Yep. So again, it's really just showing the, 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 oscillating cycles of return leadership between your core assets in red and your inflation sensitive diversifiers in green. Uh, key point here, um, look at this, uh, this text box with the white background, the full period performance for both, identical, identical. So when we go back long periods of time, the return of either style of portfolio has been identical but they just provide it in different times, okay? So we're obviously coming out of an equity-led period, uh, really since the taper tantrum in 2013. But, you know, you could use the eyeball test here. That's why we have the question mark on the right-hand side. But we don't rely on eyeball tests. We'll show our actual return analytics, which suggests that this reversal is, you know, on the verge of occurring right now and likely to play out over the next decade or so. Okay. So a real tailwind environment for all assets. Um, Let's jump ahead to page 12. We'll do a performance review. So page 12 only shows market returns. We're not yet talking about the fund. Um, again, we're going to use the same color coding throughout. Equities in red, mainstream equities in red. That's developed equities. Core bonds in blue. And then all the diversifying and inflation-sensitive assets in green. When we think about what's the relevant market for all assets, to gauge performance, well, it's the green diversifiers. And for brevity, we, we give you the, the takeaway in the, the green text box in the upper right. We just give you the simple average return across these major diversifiers. Again, by the way, it's these same six that we used, uh, Joseph, in the previous exhibit that you asked about. Um, so the equal weighted return or the average return for the quarter, Q3 was negative 0.1. Probably more interestingly for the year to date period, 8.8. .8, and the trailing five year period, plus 5.3. In other words, if you as a plan wanted to be in these markets, you could 
invest in them yourselves. You can make an equated portfolio, find some low cost index funds, and this is roughly be the returns you get. It's the market return. Hopefully all asset tracks these returns because those are the home based markets and gives you incremental performance. That's that's our value proposition. And indeed you'll you'll see that's the case. So keep these returns in mind and again let's just focus on year to date 8.8 .8 and trailing five year, five point three. When we turn to page 13, the next page, if you go to the bottom table on the lower right, you'll see the year-to-date return uh, for all assets. And indeed, you see that the year-to-date return uh, isn't 8.3, or 8, excuse me, 8.8, .8, it's 13.9. Uh, uh, so all asset has not only given you the general return of these diverse fires, but it's actually amplified it and amplified it quite meaningfully. And that's both through our asset allocation decisions and also because we implement not through passive index funds, which give you index minus returns, but because we implement through actively managed PIMCO funds, which give you index plus 1% historically net of fees. That's a big return advantage. I sit over the five year horizon the, the markets on average have delivered a 5.3% return. All assets give you 8% return net of fees. So again, providing in the neighborhood of roughly three percentage points net of fee incremental return per annum over that period, giving you the exposure to those markets, but also using our tools to give you incremental net of fee return. Um, you can see the since inception <clears throat> of your account which is 05, um, almost a CPI plus five return over that period, 6% versus 7.1. And if we go back as long as possible for the fund, which is almost 20 years now, the fund has achieved CPI plus five. Um, and so achieving CPI plus five, you know, over 20 years, that's over all these different cycles and on the heels of a period that was a headwind period for diverse fires, you know, that's a that's a that's a pretty good outcome, and I think it's an outcome that's reflective of what we we aim to deliver going forward. An alternative way of viewing the return is on the next page, page 14, where again we see the the net of fee all asset return in blue, and we compare that with the fund's primary benchmark, which is tips, in green. Huge outperformance versus tips. And we also compare it to the dotted gray line, which is the CPI plus five you know, aspirational long-term target. And again, that, that is a dotted line because that's not investable. That's just a, a return target that we, we dangle out there, so to speak, and, and aim to achieve over a full cycle, okay? So I think, um, you know, I'm very pleased to report that the All Asset Fund has, has done a you know, has done its job in terms of providing you strategic exposure to diversifiers, inflation sensitive assets, and giving you significantly superior returns than a hypothetical do it yourself in the same markets. I um, mean, we think we can continue to do this going forward. There's probably additional points I could make, but that, that's in a nutshell the, the key takeaways from the backward looking. If there's other questions on performance, I'm happy to talk to them or we could transition to our outlook and current positioning. Uh, just a general comment, maybe we'll cover this in what's coming up, but um, within your diversifier bucket, you know, the three quarter percent of the portfolio, how, how much, uh, what's, what's sort of the magnitude of the swings between the individual asset classes within that? So let's go back to, um, I think a picture is often easiest way to, to visualize this. It's page, uh, page six. So these are the actual allocations of the fund going back to its inception. So again, nearly 20 years. Uh, you can see the major asset class categories on the far right. Um, EM equities at the top, commodities and REITs, EM bonds, and, and so forth on the way down. And so just eyeballing across, you can get a sense that, yeah, we're, we're definitely tactical. Um, but uh, mind you, like I said, this is a 20-year chart. So our, our tactical program is not a not some high-frequency hedge fund where we're whipsawing from a Tuesday to a Wednesday. I mean, there's there's a gradualness to it. But when markets become more volatile, 
that's when we tend to make our more dramatic shifts. Why is that? Because big dislocations in market create the biggest opportunities to rebalance from an asset allocation perspective. I'll show you that in, in a few moments uh, when we go to our current allocations, but I'll, I'll pick out just a couple of representative points here to, to make a point. Um, I think a real neat one to look at is inflation linked bonds towards the middle. Uh, inflation linked bonds are the second to lightest shade of green. You can see that in the recent period, it's relatively small kind of single digit percentage points. As you go backwards, it shrunk a little bit in the 16, 17 uh, time frame. And as you go all the way to the left-hand side of the chart, you can see it's actually quite big. And in fact, in 2003, when we launched the fund, that lightest shade green uh, spans from 30% up to roughly 80%. It was half of the portfolio. Wow. So tips in our, in our paradigm have ranged from half of the portfolio to low single digits. Not in a quarter, <laughs> over 20 years. But yep. why is that? Well, back when we launched the fund in 2003, what were tips yielding? The real yields on tips were 2.5%, even approaching 3%. That's CPI plus 25 to 3. Well, if your goal is CPI plus 5, and you can get CPI plus 25 government guaranteed, hey, we're going to load up on that. That's, that's easy pickings. But as we all know, today, government bond yields are at or near historic lows. What's the real yield on tips today? It's negative 1%. Mm -hmm. So went from plus 2.5 to minus 1. Well, if you're trying to reach CPI plus 5, starting out at CPI minus 1, that doesn't do a lot for you. Yep. So, so that's why the, flex, the, the tactical flexibility of the portfolio is, is attractive because it allows us to pursue a consistent, ambitious, real return goal while having flexibility across the tools. Okay. So what, what, are the, what are the question in that general area is, so within these, what are there about nine or 10 categories on the right-hand side, do you spend, does your team spend most of its time analyzing macroeconomic issues that are driving the relative performance of each of these categories or within each category, looking at specific investments? You understand it's, what I'm saying? I do. It's, yeah. it's both. Yeah. Uh, we model each asset class uh, from a bottoms up perspective using what we call the building blocks of return, which at the most simplistic level recognizes that every asset class's return, whether expected future return or actual historical return, can be decomposed into three fundamental parts. What's its yield, what's its growth in income, and what's its valuation change. For treasuries, you know, the yield is observable. There is no growth in income. It's fixed income. Valuation change is, is, a, is a, a price gain or loss as yields move. For stocks, you have a dividend yield. Uh, growth is long-term growth and earnings, and then a PE change is the valuation change. And there's there's more micro elements in each of those, but at a, at a high level, that's the framework to build the bottoms up. Uh, but there is also a macro component too, uh, and the macro component does look at kind of key economic variables um, in terms of measures of, of financial strength, uh, financial market indicators such as slope of the yield curve, as well as your some of your classic. Uh, macroeconomic strength indicators like a PMI or industrial production surveys, things like that. Um, and so there's a combination of you know, long-term factors, like are stocks rich or cheap? That's a long-term factor because that doesn't mean they're going to go to equilibrium over the next month. Mm -hmm. And then there's shorter horizon factors that looks at macroeconomic strength and some other shorter tactical signals that are all integrated to create a, a portfolio that balances long horizon and short horizon signals so that you kind of get the, you get the mean, mean reversion right in the long horizon, but you get a more return capturing short horizon journey while you wait for the valuations to move towards equilibrium. Yep, got it, thanks. Okay, um, kind, of, kind of moving forward, so let, that's, a, that's probably a good segue to um, our forward looking view. Let's jump if you will to page 24. 
as you move to page 24, this is uh, this shows the output of what I just described. So the output of our building blocks of returns. Um, and in fact, if you want to go and research affiliates website, uh, there's a drop down menu that says Asset Allocation Interactive. You can actually look at this page in a web based format. You can click on all the icons here, and it breaks down all of our expected returns into those components that I just said. Uh, but in any event, what you're looking at here is a 10 year expected return for all these major asset classes. Uh, this is a nominal space, uh, so it includes inflation expectation. Um, and the box really gives you the main takeaway. 60-40 today, after years of outperformance, and as I said, being at all-time high price levels today, it's just not priced for compelling forward-looking returns. There's absolutely no dispute on the 40. We know what bond yields are. And even if you argued a little bit on the, on the U.S. equity part, it doesn't meaningfully move the 60-40 picture. By contrast, all the green triangles, which are collectively represented in the green diamond that's boxed, they've underperformed in recent years. They have better initial conditions, therefore, of lower starting prices and higher starting yields. Collectively, they have a higher expected return. This spread between the expected return of these two markets is elevated. That's a 3% return spread. Remember I said over the long horizon, they've had the same exact return. That was one of the first pages we looked at. So if they're now, the expected return is 3% different, that tells you one's, one's relatively cheap and one's relatively rich. So the good news is all asset is, um, is the beneficiary of the cheapness in the green diversifiers. Uh, today they're priced to deliver about a 4% nominal return. But that's just a passive equal weighted index returns. In all asset, we're not passive. We implement through PIMCO funds. And as I've said, those PIMCO funds have, have their actual performance history has added 1% per annum on average, net of all fees and expenses. So take the 4% here and bump it to five. It's actually four and a half, so bump it to five and a half. And of course, in all asset, we're not equal weighted. We just uh, address James's question. If we can add 1% of value added by tactically rotating into higher expected return assets at the expense of lower expected return assets, maybe that adds another percent. So now the five and a half goes to six and a half. Well, it's six and a half percent return. Now we're starting to approach something like a CPI plus five level. So, so our work suggests that over the coming decade, which is the time horizon of this chart, all asset is poised to continue to achieve a return in the vicinity of CPI plus five. I can't tell you definitively we will be able to hit it. The marketplace today is much more challenging to hit CPI plus five than it was 10 to 20 years ago. But we think we can get a return that's in that vicinity. And in any event, we think the return that we're able to deliver is likely to meaningfully outpace what you're likely to get from your 60-40 portfolio over the coming five to 10 years. So again, just reinforcing the same points, diversification operates in cycles. Uh, the tailwinds are now at the, at the back of all asset style of portfolio. Uh, in terms of our positioning, we show that on page 25. That's the next page. Before, before you go there, on page uh, 24, all asset yield is 3.41%. Correct. Is that quarterly distribution? That is, it's different than our distribution yield. The, the, it's always a confusing element with mutual funds. But what funds distribute is a function of not just yield, but also realized gains and losses and subject to some silly uh, tax rules as well. So when we post this yield here, this is what I, I'd like you to think of as the investment yield of all asset. In other words, if you look at the weighted sum of the dividend yield of our equities and the yield to maturity of our bonds, the portfolio in total is yielding 3.4%. Or in other words, if there is no price change in our assets over the coming year, what return would you expect this portfolio to deliver? 3.4%. That's the investment yield of the portfolio. Okay. Okay. 
And by the way, c- contrast that yield with you know what you're getting in most markets. That's a pretty attractive yield in the current environment. So that's about as, as reasonably good as, of a starting point as you can get um, before adding capital appreciation on top. Okay. Um, a question on the bonds. Do you have uh, a percentage where you can't go above or below, say, triple B or or double or A? So we, we don't have, we don't have a max high yield allocation, um, and in fact, maximum high yield allocations are very uncommon to see in multi asset portfolios like this. The reason being because if you if you think of quality, where government bonds are up at the top and high yield bonds are at the bottom, well, there's actually something that's below high yield bonds, which is equities. Equities are riskier than high yield bonds. So it, it, it's, it doesn't make that much sense when you're making guidelines to limit your high yield bonds, but then be able to allocate a lot to equities, which makes the portfolio even risk, riskier. So the way we, we practically manage this is, is twofold. We have a 50-50% limitation on, on equities in the portfolio. Um, and number two, going back to the point I made in the outset, we want to keep our risk in total for the portfolio around 9%. Now we'll move that up or down as opportunities emerge or go away in the marketplace. But on average, we're gonna be in that kind of 9% average volatility area. And, and, and so this just gives us flexibility in terms of how we want to achieve it. If there's more attractive to achieve it in, in high yield bonds versus equities, we'll lean more into high yield bonds. If we think it's better to be more barbelled, in other words, not have much in, in credit, but have more in equities and more in high grade bonds, we can do that as well. What is the average yield to maturity in the bond portfolio? Uh, well, it varies with time. Um, uh, the, the, the combined yield to maturity, as, as we just said here, is, uh, is 3.41. Now that includes a yield to maturity from, uh, from, the, from the equities as well. Equities tend to yield a little less than the bonds. So our bond, our, our, our bond yield to maturity is probably just a, a touch higher than 3.4%. But what was the time? I think I asked, what, what was your average? What is the average yield? the average of maturity on, on those bonds. Oh, oh okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. yeah, yeah. Uh, so good, good segue to the next page, um, page 25 in the lower right. Our average duration in the portfolio is 4.7 years. So a, a meaningful uh, amount of, of duration, um, a meaningful amount of interest rate sensitivity, and that's basically part of our defensive toolkit. Um, as you look to the right, the rightmost bar, that's our current allocation breakdown. And before I kind of go into the details of our current allocation, I'd, I'd just call out what I think is a, kind of an interesting point. What you'll really see is you'll see a big change in our allocation between December 19th, which is the fifth bar from the right, and then all the other bars to the right. In other words, the stress from the COVID markets in the first half of 2020 created a tremendous opportunity for us to rebalance the portfolio, which has benefited your returns. The stress that we saw in COVID affected all risk markets. All risk markets sold sold pretty materially and, and somewhat indiscriminately. Well, while that's scary for the typical investor in the moment, from our perspective, you know, as an asset allocator, this is, these are the moments that we live for. Because when you have distress, that means you have opportunity. Uh, and so we, we've pretty meaningfully rebalanced the portfolio, re-risked into these newly cheapened markets um, in the middle of 2020, basically on the view that, you know, the world isn't coming to an end, that markets have, have excessively sold off. And this is a good opportunity to dollar cost in at much cheaper prices so that when markets rebounded, we would asymmetrically participate in the rebound relative to the drawdown and bring our investors through net net with cumulative positive results. And that's, that's basically what we've seen. So if we look at the December 19, and I'll just go from the bottom up, 
we had nothing in U.S. equities. After they sold off, we bumped that up to seven. That's a pretty meaningful shift. And we focus in particular in, in value small cap, which, uh, which was particularly bludgeoned. In the darker red, which is developed, ex S developed equities outside of the U.S., we roughly doubled that from 6 to 14%. That's another meaningful shift. Those sold off just as much as U.S. equities. If we go from the top down, uh, the darkest green there is EM equities. That was 26% of the portfolio a quarter. We let that shrink. Why? It wasn't because we didn't like EM equities, but we already had a lot. And we had some other markets that also sold off, like the ones just beneath it. Commodities and REITs absolutely took it on the chin um, during the COVID period. What an exciting opportunity to allocate into those markets, both of which are highly inflation sensitive, by the way, and have benefited the portfolio me meaningfully since. Um, we also let our, um, uh, the emerging market bond allocation shrink. And so basically coming in from the end of 19 to, this, to, into, to into the end of 2020, the COVID stress gave us an opportunity to rebalance the portfolio, create a much more diversified return seeking portfolio than what had previously been just really an EM emphasis. Um, and that's continued to benefit the portfolio. You'll see as we move from December 20th, that bar to the right, not meaningful changes. It's been thematically the same. Markets have continued to rebound. Markets have continued to trend. We've continued to ride that trend. Um, in the most recent quarter, the themes are still the same. There's been on the margin a little bit of de-risking. So uh, at the top, we've actually reduced our EM equities allocation. What's one of the main reasons we've done that? Well, our business cycle indicator, our macro indicator, James, uh, has gotten a little worse for EM. So EM equities are still cheaper than developed market equities, but the business cycle conditioning is top down or weakening. Time to ease up on that. Um, we actually continue to like commodities and REITs. So we've rotated a little more into that. That's continued to benefit. Uh, EM bonds, somewhat interestingly, we've, we've increased our EM bonds, but it's actually a de-risking move. Um, when you move from EM equities to EM bonds, that's a de-risking direction. And then within the EM bonds, we've also moved from local EM debt to dollar denominated EM debt. That's also a de-risking move. And the dollar EM debt we think is a little more attractive than the dollar EM credit, or excuse me, the, uh, than a US credit, which is you know, at all time tights in terms of spreads. So a little bit of a relative value play in there. And then I'll just note that shaded area in the middle what we've bo uh, boxed and called our defensive strategies. So this is a mix of our core bonds, which are in blue. You can think of that as your classic defense. That's where we get a lot of the duration. Uh, as well as, uh, and you see a little bit of global bonds, a little bit of inflation-linked bonds, not much, 3%. Those are our tips. And then 12% in alternative strategies. Alternative strategies are a different sort of defense for us. These are low volatility market neutral strategies kind of long short strategies that are uncorrelated to everything else. So we use that as a one-two punch alongside with our traditional core bonds in blue. Collectively, that's our defensive strategies. When bond yields get higher, we move back into the bonds. That's why you can see the bond kind of amounts have, have risen in the last quarter. After bond yields rally and bond yields are lower, we'll shift a little more into the, into the alternative strategies on the expectation that bond yields are probably likely to rise. So overall, I would characterize the current portfolio as one that is playing offense. We're modestly above our long-term average risk level. A very diversified set of return-seeking assets with a lot of inflation sensitivity coming from classic inflation fighters, such as commodities, REITs, a little bit of tips, but also what, what Rob Arnott likes to call his stealth inflation fighters. Um, and notably emerging market equities and some credit, uh, which tend to also do well when inflation's on the march, often um, because sometimes uh, EM, excuse me, EM economies, which can be commodity driven, commodity sensitive, uh, may get a little bit of an uplift when commodity prices are on the rise. 
I'll, I'll leave you with one last page in terms of things that we're rooting for going forward that could provide additional tailwinds, and that's on page 31. And then I'll, I'll pause and take some questions. I see we're right at about the 35-minute mark. Um, real fast, what are some things that can provide some additional tailwinds beyond what we've talked about today? Uh, left to right, value stocks. The value factor within equities is always the tug of war between value and growth. Value is historically cheap. It's rebounded over the last year from the zeroth percentile to the fourth percentile. Fourth percentile is still extraordinarily cheap. If value rebounds, we have about a 40% allocation to value equities. So that could be an additional alpha tailwind in the portfolio. Number two, uh, the dollar is objectively strong. I don't think anyone would argue that one either. Uh, so if we get a little bit of dollar weakness, which is often correlated with third point inflation, that can benefit the portfolio. Uh, for me, I think the, the inflation one is really the, the more important one here. Um, we all know inflation risks today. Inflation is north of 6% today. But the market is discounting it. The market, market inflation expectations are still only at 2.5%, which is basically at the Fed's target. Um, PIMCO is going through our cyclical form right now. The, the quick takeaway with respect to inflation is that we think inflation is likely to moderate as we progress through 2022, uh, maybe peaking in the first half of 2022. But we are also very cognizant that there are factors that could keep it stickier to the upside and with the upside risks as well. So, um, does all asset need rising inflation to do well? It does not. We've achieved CPI plus five for 20 years. That's been a period where inflation on balance has been declining. But if inflation is stable or modestly rising, inflation expectations are stable to modestly rising, that's a tailwind for our strategy. So the great thing is, look, if inflation comes back down, that gets us more in the Goldilocks environment for your core assets. If inflation and inflation risks stay elevated, that's why you keep all assets as a complementary sidecar. So, uh, you know, in summary, I'm, I'm pleased to report very strong trailing performance. Uh, and I'm also pleased to report an outlook that is constructive to our style of portfolio, reflective of the diversification cycles that tend to exist over longer periods of time. I'll, I'll pause here and, and certainly welcome any final questions you have. How, how uh, what, what's the total assets in the fund right now and how big is your team that supports it? Sure. Uh, the, the fund is 17 billion. So it's, it's a large and, and very popular fund. Um, the team, the direct team, at Reister Phillips, you have Rob Arnott and Chris Brightman, who are the, the head uh, folks at Reister Phillips. They are the named portfolios. They have a right-hand person who's Jim Mesterzo, who's the CIO of multi-asset strategies at Reister Affiliates. They are the key people at Reister Affiliates who run the models, make the final investment decisions. They're, of course, supported by a team of Reister Affiliates. And then at PIMCO, as you know, all asset implements through PIMCO funds. So basically, everyone at PIMCO is also part of the, the all asset team indirectly. The last thing I would mention is that Part of the investment process at Research Affiliates, while their process is largely model driven in terms of making the, the allocation decisions, we also meet formally every month with specialists at PIMCO. We call it our, our investment committee meeting. Uh, and we, we dig deep into each HPM specialty team's uh, investment views in their area to make sure that what we're doing in all asset is reflective of what they're seeing from a more micro hands on the ground perspective at PIMCO. So uh, without sounding glib, uh, you have basically all of PIMCO really working within this portfolio, truly. I mean, in addition to the team at Research Affiliates who's making the ultimate allocation decisions. Uh, just, um, I'm curious, do you think that you right now you're twice the size basically in equities traditionally i think you're on page seven or so it said you traditionally have 10 percent. now you have 20 percent. do you anticipate changing that or are you more that bullish on the stock market overall 
Uh, in, in in U.S. equities, sorry, sp- focusing on U.S. equities specifically, yeah. So so U.S. equities. Let me let me just show your views again. We can focus on that on page twenty four. Um, so here in page twenty four, focus on the red squares. Uh, U.S. equities. Uh, that's large cap, the one that's right next to commodities there we see a 2% or so return for US equities over the next decade, uh, kind of a lost decade, kind of like the, the, the 2020s were following the big run up in the dot-com era. Is that, is that nominal or real? Nominal, that's nominal. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, US small, a bit higher, close to about 4%, right? And now what, what you, and then you can see developed X US equities is even higher and, uh, and then EM equities is to the upper right. Um, the other th- the thing that I'd note, though, is that, which is not shown on here, these are the market cap indexes. If you were to look at a value index, and in the all asset fund, our, our, our exposures today in equities are primarily focused on the value, uh, value implementation of equities, that's expected to add easily another 2 to 4% given the historic cheapness in value. So that's why, you know, our... our our equity allocation is bumped up. Something that's that's expected to return two to four percent with with stock like risk, that's not attractive. But if we can get the value form of equities with the incremental return that that brings to it, that's that's really what makes U.S. equities interesting. So we like value equities. We like small cap equities. We really like small cap value equities. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. We've You're been good. with you, like you said, for a long time. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Greg. Thank, thank you, Greg. Thanks, Thanks, committee. Thank you. Britt, you're up with the uh, performance review. Sure, Frank. Um, would you like me to share my screen, or is everyone okay to follow along? Yeah, we're good. I'm good. Okay, great. And please is everybody with- good? A little under the Everybody waters. good? Okay. Yep. All right, go ahead. Great. Um, so just start on page three of the PDF uh, showing the October <clears throat> asset distribution. Total assets up to about 551.7 million. Uh, you can see a slight underweight to total equities um, that really falls within US and international. Uh, and slight overweight to global equity, long short, and private equity. <clears throat> um, continues to be a slight underweight to fixed income and a slight overweight to PIMCO. Um, on page four of the PDF, we show performance uh, for the fiscal year and longer periods. Uh, for the fiscal year, you can see LSV continues to uh, do well. I think one of the things that John emphasized was uh, value stocks and LSV is really a deep value manager. And <clears throat> um, I think they're poised to do well as growth uh, or as value rotates into favor. Um, and then you can see Columbus Circle uh, again has performed extremely well fiscal year and over the longer periods. Within international equities, uh, you can see Silchester uh, has outperformed. A little bit, Artisan is underperformed <clears throat> um, slightly, most of that being driven by some of their financials exposure. Um, BlackRock is slightly underperformed. I think some of their emphasis on Asia and in particular China uh, has hurt <clears throat> fiscal year to date, uh, but no concerns with the team or, or the strategy. Uh, within global equity long short, you can see ABS uh, has eked out a return and, and Blackstone more muted. Um, interesting environment for these guys. And we're seeing a lot of volatility in the markets, which, which should help them going forward. <clears throat> Longer term returns continue to be strong. Uh, and then finally on page five, showing fixed income, <clears throat> uh, you know, muted returns, very low yields, as we all know. Uh, UBS has done very well. Uh, outperforming by about 2%. Uh, and you can see PIMCO, while well, they've underperformed the TIPS index, mainly driven by some of that equities exposure that John discussed, uh, they've had extremely good, strong returns over the trailing year. Uh, so overall, 
fiscal year to date through October, about 2.3% return, slightly underperforming the custom benchmark, um, which does not take into account the private equity returns. Um, and you can see longer term total fund, uh, extremely strong absolute basis, as well as on a relative basis. Any, Any questions? questions? No, I, I would observe that if, if PIMCO's correct about US equity outlook, we're in trouble. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're thinking we're looking at 2% nominal returns and that's, you know, that's 35% of our portfolio. Yeah, I think it's hard for, for every investor out there. I mean, yep. when you look at it, where, where are you going to go? Where are you going to put that <clears throat> risk allocation within the portfolio? And at the same time, while PIMCO has a lot of experts, I don't think the last three to five years would have been predicted yeah, I agree. what we've seen and, and the reaction from the bottom of COVID to today is unprecedented. Yeah, and so we don't want to get in the mode of reacting to the last presentation we heard either. So <laughs> <laughs> it goes without saying. Hey, Frank, while we're on this uh, this page, do you want to address the cash, uh, you know, uh, uh, agenda number seven before we go to IPS while we're on can this? We, we can no, do I was going to bring up a spreadsheet to, to show where... Um, we would suggest to raise cash from. I can I'm do asking now Frank, or... if you want to do that, Frank. You want to do that? Well, we'll you know, Brick, he's got something. Do you want to wait? We just have uh, the IPS review. After this, yeah. Yeah, it's up to you, Frank. What would you like? To... Go ahead. We could, if you want. It's yeah, sure. Why don't we do it? We'll we'll just go to the cash now. Sure. So you, I'm going to share my with... screen. Um, Chitsume may relay that through December, <clears throat> there will be about 3 million of cash on hand. Um, at, the, and, at, the, at the end of December. Right. So with the idea that we will not revisit cash until the end of the March meeting, <clears throat> we thought raising 9 million was appropriate. So that way there'll be enough cash for capital calls if necessary. Um, and based on the current market environment uh, and, and some of the <clears throat> feedback we've heard from the board, it seemed like PIMCO was not the most desirable place to raise cash. Um, so we're suggesting raising about 6 million from equities, um, 3 million from Columbus Circle, given their extremely good performance. <clears throat> um, you know, sell your winners and and, and they've done, uh, done extremely well. So our suggestion would be from, from BlackRock and Columbus Circle, uh, as well as TCW MetWest to raise the 9 million in cash. Yeah, that's 3 million from each? Correct. Yep. Knowing okay. that you will have an, continue to have an overweight with PIMCO, which understanding the inflationary environment we're in uh, is certainly reasonable and you'll have an underweight to both fixed income and public equity. And would, you send, yeah, and would you send that in an email to people? Just- Yes, yeah, happy please. to. Okay. Um, there's a proposal to move the 9 million. Is, does anybody want to make that proposal? The motion? I motion I'll, I'll motion that, that, that we I'll motion that we accept the proposal to raise cash by uh, taking three million each from uh, BlackRock, Columbus Circle, and uh, NatWest. Is second. there a second? Yeah, I will second. second. And is there any discussion? <clears throat> and if not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Passes. Thank you. Great. Uh, Chits, can, uh, one other thing, because we're on this Chitsume, um, if you're there, um, I got a, something from McCrory with they're going to liquidate. Is that right? I don't so know. The infrastructure is finally coming to an end. Yeah, they're final. <laughs> they're going to finally liquidate the funds. I don't know if you got something I got it today and as an email. I might have gotten it, Frank, and I may have missed it. Hold on. Let me 
I mean, it's there. We we have a small amount of money, but there was. Um, it was in anticipation of an upcoming distribution notice related to the funds liquidation. Please review the payment instructions provided at the links below. The bank details reported are inaccurate. Please complete uh, the included form with the correct bank deals. So that- Yeah, that, I received it as well, Frank. I can port yeah. it to Chitsume. <clears throat> um, I would assume, assuming nothing has changed on Norwalk's end, in regards right. to the bank details, there shouldn't be anything that needs to what, be. What do we expect there in terms of uh, cash? I think there's only about 13,000 left. Yeah, it's very little. It's just a matter of, oh, and by the way, for the, <laughs> for the board to know that, um, and we still, I think, I don't know if you get it, but I still periodically get something from um, um, Zilchester. <laughs> which is yeah there, there we have no money <laughs> yeah i mean it's like I see it. salt in the wounds we have like, I see like, it. yeah we have like um, four million shares or something that has a valuation of zero yeah we it's been written down for the pension fund's sake if anything comes of it we uh will certainly know but right i wouldn't hold your breath <laughs> yeah okay so we all set with the money then the last thing is the IPS review. I'm not sure who's doing that. Yep, so <clears throat> the only suggestion that we had based on the last meeting was um, the board yeah. wanted to move the cash target to 2%. So all we are suggesting changing is in on page 11 of the PDF, Yep. reducing domestic fixed income target by 1%, and increasing cash is target by 1%. Right. Yeah. I think Jim uh, brought that up at the last meeting, the, the cash part of it, right, Jim? Right. I think I so, think yeah. So do we need a motion to accept this or? Anybody, yeah. have, first of all, does anybody have any, I, I read it over, I don't have any questions myself, but does anybody read it over and they have any questions? in regards to this, except other, aside from the cash position. No, I mean, nothing else has changed. No, we, we accepted this a while ago, didn't we? Right, we went through it again, but I didn't know whether just anybody had any second thoughts on it. If not, is there a motion to accept the, uh, with that one change to cash? Well, there was also the change for domestic fixed income, right? Yeah, it was this, it was a reduction of domestic fixed income by one percent and an increase to cash by one percent. Right. So your motion to uh, accept it has changed. So moved to uh, change the allocation schedule as uh, proposed. Excellent. Is there a second to that? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Passes unanimous. With that, I'd like to, unless there's any other discussions, to adjourn motion the meeting. To adjourn. Okay, motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Proposed. Excellent. Thank you. Next, we have an OPEB meeting. I'd like to call the meeting of OPEB to order and um, approve the minutes from the last meeting which are very short and brief. Motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Is there any public comment? If not, we'll go on to performance review. Great. Hey, hey, based on where you're going, are you going for a second term here or what? Second <laughs> term for what? You're, you're moving us right along here. You're doing a real good job hey, here, Frank. Hey, you know, I mean. <laughs> All right, let's go. Well, then, you, a roll. you know, when, when the you holiday said season, you Joe. weren't going to be coming if they went to eight o'clock, I said, I better get these things done. Don't let's slow do the it. man down. He's, uh, he's on a mission here. Let's do you it. Know? Let's do All it. All right. <clears throat> on, on page three of the OPEB flash report, uh, you can see 141.1 million at the end of October. Slight overweight to domestic equity, slight underweight to fixed income. 
And then on page four, you can see performance, fiscal year to date, about 2.8% return. You can see the passive providers <clears throat> have done fine. There was some fair value pricing um, mismatch with the international stock fund, but that really gets smoothed out over time and really strong performance uh, across the board uh, for the one, three, five, and seven year periods. Keep Any questions? Simple. Keep it simple, stupid. This one's working pretty good. This one's worked well. <laughs> You know, so much for that idea that Britt wants to go and talk to us about how we're going to diversify. And, you know, um. no, I think <laughs> I think OPEB's doing great, <clears throat> and it is diversified. It's very diversified. Yeah. Right. Um. Anyway, any any other discussion? If not, I hope everybody has a good holiday, good Christmas, good New Year. We you will... need a motion to adjourn. Yeah, we're going to do that in a second. I was just going to say, I hope everybody does, you know. And then, uh, I mean, you know, uh, I don't want to say anything, but Joe's like complaining that I might be making these meetings too short. So, I'm oh, no correct. complaints here, Frank. No complaints here. <laughs> but, anyways, and hopefully, I'm going to, I will be trying to get it so that we can start to meet in person. In fact, I was going to, add, I had a question. Um, <clears throat> For Henry, in regards to the idea that um, he had said recent in the last meeting that he talked to IT, and I don't know whether Chitsume, if you know anything about this, but um, he was going to talk to IT about maybe we could start to meet in person. Chitsume, do you know if there's any meetings that have been going on in person? There hasn't been any meetings in person. I know most of them are at the Zoom platform currently, but the room are available. And I know Henry did mention that IT set up where there could be a hybrid type of meeting where it's in person and also Zoom at the same time. Is What about before we close this meeting, um, does anybody have any feelings about whether they would prefer to have a meeting in person or continue on Zoom? I'm personally relatively indifferent. This this works. I'm fine doing this. I'm also fine taking a drive. Does it matter to me, I, Frank? I think we ought to wait until the spring where there'd be less. That's because less... you're, you're in Florida, yeah. right, Richard? Right, sure. That's because no, you're in no, Florida. I'm, 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 I'm being serious. You know, you, you we we all see how the how the uh, infection rates are going up as everyone goes back indoors, and it comes down when everyone gets out of doors. So, you know, we might as well, you know, be a, take uh, the trend is our friend there. That's fine. Yeah, works for me. Yeah, that's, works. That's we'll, we'll put it under. We'll put it in the category of wait and see. How's that? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, anyways, with all that. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. So, second. Second. <laughs> second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Have a great holiday, everybody. Yes. Everybody Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Take care. Happy New Year. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.